This is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Here are the headlines for Friday, October 23rd. The OBGYN department at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center is closed. That's according to several mothers who say the abrupt closure is leaving dozens of mothers scrambling to figure out where to have their babies and how to pay for that medical service. In an exclusive report, our national correspondent Dalton Walker spoke to several mothers who now face uncertainty and enormous medical bills. It's stressful, it's very hard. When Brianna Oman learned she was going to have her second child, she started going to the Phoenix Indian Medical Center for prenatal visits. That was 18 weeks ago, and everything seemed to be on track until her checkup on September 10th. So I started going to um, PIMC back in, I think it was June, um, and everything was going fine with all my prenatal appointments. Um, and then in September, they told me that they were no longer um, doing labor and deliveries. Um, and so after that, you know, the experience just kind of went down, downhill. She isn't alone. While other women have told any country today the reason for the closure was for renovations, Almond says she was told the department was closing due to poor management. She was advised to return to the reservation to give birth. For her, that would be in Tuba City, more than 200 miles north of Phoenix and in a high COVID area. Tuba City would be an option if COVID weren't um, weren't so active. She's due to give birth at the end of November, and she's still not sure what she and her husband are going to do. Again, we're in a financial bind already due to COVID. Um, my husband's work is slowing down immensely. PIMC provides health care to more than 140,000 people from the greater Phoenix area. According to its website, Patients come from 67% of all 573 federally recognized tribes. Indian Health Services uses my census number to get funding, to get money, for to provide health care for us. And um, it's not being provided, you know. And again, it's not my fault. It's not the nurse's fault. Um, it's whoever's in charge of the department's fault that they let that department shut down. We have reached out to PIMC for comment on the closure and are waiting for a response. In Phoenix, Dalton Walker, Indian Country Today. You can read more about mothers who are dealing with this closure in Dalton Walker's story on our website IndianCountryToday.com and we will continue to follow the story. President Trump says he supports the Lumbee tribe's quest for federal recognition. This comes two weeks after his opponent, Joe Biden's presidential campaign, announced Biden's support of full recognition for the tribe in North Carolina. For more than a century, the Lumbee have sought federal recognition, but has been met with indifference and red tape. In a post on social media, the Lumbee called the support historic. North Carolina Senators Richard Burr and Thomas Till Tom Tillis sponsored the Lumbee Recognition Act in May of 2019. However, that bill has been stuck in the U.S. Senate's Indian Affairs Committee since it was introduced. A companion bill in the U.S. House has also seen little movement since its introduction last year. The Recognition Act would make the nation eligible for additional benefits and services from the federal government. $3 million in funding will be going to 18 federally recognized tribes. The funds are for American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and villages to document, preserve, and revitalize Native languages. The U.S. Department of Interior's Office of Indian Energy and Economic Development approved the funds through its Living Language Grant Program. Some of the nations receiving funding include the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, the Comanche, and the Lummi Nations. Assistant Secretary Tara Sweeney is encouraging more tribes to apply in the next funding opportunity. Grant submissions are rated on the effectiveness of the language programs being proposed. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today for Friday, October 23rd. I'm Patty Thalahungva. When we come back, the intense standoff in Nova Scotia as Mi'kmaq people exercise their treaty right to fish.
It's election 2020 and nearly 40 Native Americans are running for offices across the country. Some are running for the Congress, others are hoping to get elected to state seats. I'm Mark Trahan and our team from Indian Country Today will be bringing you live coverage on election night. I'm Jordan Benipigay. I'll be following the results from our bureau in Washington, D.C. as we see which candidate will lead the nation for the next four years. And in Arizona, Montana, Michigan, and Washington, Native candidates are running for seats like State Auditor, County Recorder, and State Supreme Court. I'm Malia Chavez. We'll bring you the results of those races and more. I'm Patty Thoahunga. Be sure to tune in on Tuesday, November 3rd for complete coverage of Native Vote 20 right here on Indian Country Today. This is Indian Country Today. Who has the right to fish for lobster in Nova Scotia? And what are the treaty rights for the First Nations people there? The issue has been heating up recently, and the Sebagan Egeri people are in the middle of some very intense situations with the non-native fishing community. Maureen Gugu is the editor of Gugu Gues News, and she's from the community that's in the middle of this fight. Welcome, Maureen. Thanks for having me, Patty. Well, it's got to be really hard to, to report in your own community, but um, give us some background. How long has this issue been going on? Oh, if you really want to go way back, this issue's been going on in, since the late 90s, or I should say since the 90s itself. It started back in 1993 when Donald Marshall Jr., who's a Mi'kmaq, who was a Mi'kmaq from the Member Two First Nation in Cape Breton, he was charged with uh, catching and selling eels out of season without a license. Now, the, um, the, the tribal organizations here in, in Nova Scotia, the Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq and the Confederacy Mainland Mi'kmaq decided to represent him in court. And they decided to use the pre-Confederation treaties that were signed between um, Mi'kmaq, Wollastook and Passamaquoddy people and the British Crown at the time. Those treaties were signed back in the 1700s and they're classified or, or referred to as the peace and friendship treaties. And those treaties are basically exactly what they say. It, they were just, there were guidelines, they were rules on how both, um, you know, the indigenous people in this region and the, the European settlers were going to coexist. And in those treaties, they recognized that, you know, th that the indigenous people in this region, uh, the three nations that I mentioned, have rights to hunt and fish to sustain themselves, to provide for themselves. And those treaties recognize that. So when Donald Marshall Jr. went to court, his lawyers argued that those treaties gave him the right to catch and sell eels for a living. In the Nova Scotia courts in the mid nineties, um, he was found guilty and he was fined for violating um, the, the Federal Fisheries Act, but he appealed them. And that appeal went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, which is the highest court in this country. And on September 17th, 1999, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the treaties of seven, the peace and friendship treaties of 1760 and 61 um, were valid. And that they, that basically that, it's not that they gave them the right, it's that they affirmed that that right existed. So they overturned his convictions. And in that ruling, um, the, the Supreme Court justices said that um, Mi'kmaq, Wollastook, Passamaquoddy people in this region actually have a treaty right to catch and sell fish to earn a moderate livelihood. And that's what the ruling stipulates. But, but what happened was when that ruling came out, there was a lot of tensions um, because Mi'kmaq fishermen in, in northern New Brunswick started setting traps in, in waters in, in northern New Brunswick. And of course, the, they started getting into conflict with DFO who weren't ready and weren't willing to recognize um, the Supreme Court ruling. Um, so there was a lot of tension going on and, and the Supreme Court issued a, a very rare second ruling that, that stated that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans can regulate the fishery for conservation purposes. Now, how legal experts in this region have um, interpreted that is that if you're going to limit a, a treaty right, you're going to have to justify that. And justification means going back to court. 
and 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 stating your case saying we're we're limiting the treaty right on grounds of conservation that hasn't happened um what's been going on is is dfo in in the absence of having the moderate livelihood um undefined have just been enforcing its current fishery regulations and and that's been going on since 1999. um so they've never really sat down like they've sort of sat down with first nations groups in this region to discuss moderate livelihood and what that means but they haven't really come to an agreement so what you're seeing right now happening in St. Mary's Bay with the Sebega Negati First Nation fishers is that they're not waiting for um, government to sit down and negotiate what moderate livelihood means. They're, they're just going to practice their treaty right. Wow, so from the 90s, when all when was the, the uh, overturning of uh, the lower court's ruling? When did the Supreme Court reaffirm the uh, Sebega Negati's right to fish? It's not so much Sebega Negati's uh, right, it's the, the, the Mi'kmaq people, um, Mi'kmaq people in this region, which encompasses all first, all 13 First Nation communities. Sebega Negati is just one of those communities. They're the ones that are going out and are asserting their treaty right. Um, there are other communities in this province that are doing it as well. Uh, Budladek First Nation in uh, Cape Breton they've started uh, doing their moderate livelihood fishery. And also in Cape Breton, the member two First Nation, they're getting ready to launch their own moderate livelihood fishery. So this, this issue isn't going away. In fact, more and more First Nations are, are, are starting to, um, to assert their treaty right and practice their moderate livelihood fishery. So say in uh, the 2000s and um, in the last uh, two decades, are you saying then that the uh, First Nations people there were not going out and, um, and exercising their treaty right? It's just uh, recently that they're starting to do this? Well, again, we have to take a step back to 20 years ago. With all the tensions that were happening since the Marshall ruling in 1999, um, the federal government, um, the Canadian government, um, appointed a federal negotiator to negotiate interim fishing agreements with First Nation communities in this region. In this region, for um, Mi'kmaq and Wollastook, there's about 34 uh, communities. So they, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they negotiated these interim agreements. And, and what these interim agreements did was they, they provided access to the commercial fishery, the current commercial fishery. So they, they were given a um, uh, fishing license, not just for lobsters, but for other species like snow crab, um, swordfish, tuna, you know, other, other species to go out and fish. They gave, they gave them license, so that gave them access to the commercial fishery, but they also gave them money to buy boats, gear, and to train people to work on those boats. Um, but those interim agreements basically said that if you, you know, if you take take this agreement, um, you're going to abide by the current fishery regulations, which means, um, you know, com fish commercially during the commercial seasons that are already set. Um, that was, that whole initiative was, was called the Marshall Response Initiative. And most, but not all First Nation communities in this region signed those agreements. Um, that Marshall Response Initiative expired in, 2000, in 2007. Since, since then, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans has just been issuing those First Nations who's got commercial licenses, renewals for those licenses every year. But they never really had a discussion about moderate livelihood. And the leaders in this region were expecting that. They were expecting that to happen. That's why they signed the interim agreements. It provided them access. It gave them capacity. You know, First Nation communities in this region now can generate a revenue from the fisheries but they never talked about moderate livelihood and what that means. And they were expecting the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to sit down with them and talk, talk about that, but that never happened up until late 2017, when again, another federal negotiator was appointed and they started um, talking with First Nations, but this time they made it a point to say, yes, we are going to sit down and talk about moderate livelihood and what it means to First Nation communities and how First Nation communities can exercise that treaty, right? Those talks started happening about, you know, like two years ago. But from my reporting, uh, when I spoke with uh, the co-chair of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, Terrence Paul, 
He said that those talks reached an impasse earlier this year because Department of Fisheries of Oceans, again, offered money for boats, gear, and training, but then also put in the agreement that they could not exercise their treaty right to earn a moderate livelihood from the fishery for another 10 years. And, you know, for First Nation leaders who've been waiting for 21 years to exercise their treaty right, and then having to be told that if they take this agreement, they'll have to wait another 10 years, wasn't acceptable anymore. So those talks broke off. And now you're seeing individual communities like Sebega Negadi, like Wood Ledeck, um, you know, assert their treaty right and launch their moderate livelihood fishery. Just watching the coverage of this and seeing what's happening up there, um, it's, it's very, it's intense. And, um, and yet at the bottom of this are uh, very strong treaty rights that the First Nations people have, as you've pointed out. Well, let's take a look at some of the photos that uh, you've uh, uh, taken and you're reporting there and talk to us and tell us a little bit about what we're seeing. Um, one of them was on the first day of um, the fishery. Um, there's a photo here of uh, the Sebega Negative Chief Mike Sack with community members and elders. This was taken on September 17th. And this was the, the launch of Sebega Negative's moderate livelihood fishery at the, Sol at the wharf in Salnierville, Nova Scotia, which is in Southwest Nova Scotia. And if you look at it on the map, it's just right on the, the shorelines of St. Mary's Bay, near the Bay of Fundy. Um, and, and what was significant about this day was that they launched it on September 17th. Now, at the beginning of this interview, I told you that September 17th, 1999, was when the Supreme Court of Canada um, recognized that uh, Mi'kmaq people, uh, Wollastook and Passamaquoddy people, have a treaty right to earn a moderate livelihood from the fishery. So this was the 21st anniversary of that court ruling. So that was what was really significant about that day. And more than 300 people gathered uh, to show support for um, the Mi'kmaq fishermen from Sebega Negadi who received um, a license and tags to go out and fish for a moderate livelihood. Um, I, I believe um, to date there's been 11 um, moderate livelihood licenses issued by Sebega Negadi, and each of those licenses um, give um, the Mi'kmaq fishermen and women um, 50 traps to, to drop in St. Mary's Bay. And the agreements tell them that they actually have to land those catches at Salmierville Wharf to make sure that they are fishing in the area that they've been designated to fish. Um, so that's, that's, that's like the, one of the main um, pictures that, that, um, that we're talking about here. So that was the, the launch of the whole fishery. Um, now, on that same day, there is another picture of, um, of one of the Mi'kmaq fishermen um, um, showing, you know, a solidarity um, assigned to uh, a boat in front of him. Now that was taken also on September 17th. Um, those, those Mi'kmaq fishers who dropped traps in St. Mary's Bay, um, they were met with a, a huge flotilla of um, uh, fishing boats owned by non-Indigenous non fishermen. Uh, and this is where the conflict is happening. Um, many of the, the non-Indigenous commercial fishermen in the region believe that um, the Mi'kmaq fishers should be fishing in the designated commercial fishing seasons. This area right now is closed to commercial fishing. So they've, they're, they've been the ones who have been protesting uh, against uh, Mi'kmaq uh, fishermen and women. So this picture was taken on that day on the waters just as the the Mi'kmaq fishermen were dropping traps in St. Mary's Bay. So that, that's, that was an, the other picture. And, and again, there's another picture of several of them on the boat. Uh, and you can see in the background um, lots of the, the, the boats that I'm talking about, the flotilla that was waiting for them. And this kind of happened over a few days, like that fishermen, the Mi'kmaq fishers were dropping traps in the bay. Um, Non-Indigenous fishermen with their boats would sweep in and cut or vandalize their traps. And this is sort of the hostilities that are happening in that region. Um, you know, they've, you know, the Mi'kmaq fishermen have had their traps uh, vandalized, which means 
they have to go and buy more traps and traps are expensive. So they've been making a call out for donations for people to provide them with traps so they can practice their treaty right. Um, so the, this was sort of the beginning of um, the violence that, that's, that, that started uh, ramping up um, in the weeks following the launch of the moderate livelihood fishery. And what about any kind of uh, police protection? I mean, if they do have that treaty right, uh, where is the uh, RCMP in all of this? There has been a police presence, but, you know, in videos that um, community members have been taken at the scene, you see the um, several RCMP officers in, in the middle trying to keep the two sides away, but not really doing anything. Um, you know, and, and just allowing the protesters to harass, bully, intimidate um, the community members and the fishermen. Um, I, the, the, the chief of uh, Sebega Negedi, um, Chief Mike Sack, has been calling for the police to do their work to protect Mi'kmaq fishers on and off the water. Um, so much so that the community actually filed um, a, court in, a temporary court injunction this week and it actually was granted. Um, and, and that injunction basically prevents the protesters from blocking the roads that lead to um, a lobster pound facility that the First Nation is using to store their lobster. It prevents, um, it, it also prevents uh, the, the protesters and their supporters from showing up at the wharf to do the same thing. It also pr prevents um, again, the protesters and their supporters from going on the waters and vandalizing the traps. And, and you know, Sebega Negedi felt the need to go to court to do this because they felt they, that the police weren't doing their job. So now they have a court order and it compels the RCMP to enforce it. And has uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made any kind of statement on the violence that's happening up there? Well, on Sunday, um, he made a he made a statement that, is, and then this came after last weekend, last weekend, last Friday night, um, one of the lobster pound facilities that, that was allowing Mi'kmaq fishermen to store their, 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 their catch um, was actually set on fire. And, and that, that, that lobster pound actually was um, earlier in the week, the, um, the site of a really angry mob. They, um, two Mi'kmaq fishermen, Jason Marr, and Robert Sack, who is the son of Donald Marshall Jr., um, they locked themselves in and there was a mob of about 200 people um, threatening to burn them out, um, um, throwing rocks at the windows and demanding that they turn over their catch. And they weren't gonna let them go unless they turned over their catch. Um, the RCMP arrived, the, they forced uh, Robert Sack and Jason Marr to leave the building. Uh, without their without their lobster, they had over um, thirty crates of lobster, which represents anywhere between three to five thousand pounds of lobster. Um, and and the the mob basically went in and and took their lobster and uh, allegedly put it back in the water. Um, so that was the site. And then on Friday, that same lobster pound was set on fire which prompted a really strong response from the government saying violence is unacceptable. And that's what uh, the Prime Minister Trudeau um, had stated um, um, earlier in the week that the, that the violence can continue, that there needs, you know, people need to sit down and, and, and work this issue out. So th that's sort of been the, the response from not just uh, Trudeau, but also his cabinet ministers. And, and what's the scene like going to be or expected to be this weekend? It's really hard to say. It really is. Um, I was down there last weekend following the, the, the lobster pound um, being set on fire. Um, people were still practicing their treaty, right? They were still going out to set traps, but the mood was really tense. Um, you know, people were anticipating something to happen. Um, you know, there, there were, you know, like people were talking that maybe the, the non-Indigenous fishermen may try to um, enter the wharf through the water. So they were keeping extra watch on the waters in the evening. Well, we'll continue to follow the story. It's, and, you know, because it's still, it's ongoing. And um, until, you know, uh, they understand what that moderate livelihood means, 
uh, definitely will be continuing to follow the story. So we just want to thank you so much, Maureen, for joining us to talk about the situation there with the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia. Uh, Maureen Gugu is the editor of Gugu Gues News there in, uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Patty. And on behalf of our entire team here at Indian Country Today, have a great weekend. And remember, uma umukatsi ukalyani, take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tolohungva. Join us again on Monday. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.